We're delighted to present renowned artist and gallery owner, Duncan McClellan, talking about creating a bowl in glass along with other glass techniques. Love Affair with Glass began as a small child while visiting a glass factory in Virginia. Many years later, after creative and entrepreneurial successes, Duncan came back to that early vision and began studying glass art, both in Venice, Italy and the US. After almost 30 years of creating and exhibiting his own work, Duncan purchased an abandoned tomato packing building in Midtown St. Petersburg, and his longtime dream of opening a glass art gallery was realized. With the addition of the St. Petersburg Hot Glass Workshop, Duncan's vision of mentoring other artists and establishing educational programming for the public continues to grow. Please join me in welcoming Duncan McClellan. Duncan. Hey, thank you, Tyler. And I want to thank everybody for being not only a part of this tonight, but being a part of Florida Craft Art. Uh, being a member is uh, very important to me. Um, this is a great organization that uh, puts on incredible exhibitions. Um, and I'm glad to be um, part of this tonight. So thank you. Uh, you wanted to know something about uh, how I saw a glass the first time. Uh, it was a trip to New York and uh, we stopped at the Blanco Glass Factory, one of the oldest uh, studios that's still working here in the United States. After working in glass for the last 35 years, um, I've learned a lot and, and I'm continually excited about watching artists not only grow, but uh, their, the immense um, dedication to creating these new thoughts, these new ideas. And glass is a very versatile medium. Uh, you can see just in our gallery, uh, we represent about 125 different artists um, from around the world. I went on to uh, something that i had always been doing, which was educating the public. Uh, because if, if the people don't know about what you're doing, they don't really realize what goes into it. So I started DMG School Project, which is an educational not-for-profit. And we go into inner city schools with our mobile units. Uh, we do residencies for emerging artists. Uh, to not only to give them the opportunity to experience a full studio time period, but also mentor them in how to make a living in class. Because if they can't continue, uh, they won't be able to get better at their craft. Then I went on to create the gardens and everything else we do at DMG School Project. But here's some shots of our hot shop and the crowds that we often bring in for that. Maybe not so much right now, uh, but we look forward to the time period we can do that in the future. Um, as you're going to see that glass is very much a, a collaborative uh, team effort. And I think that's what um, interests me about glass in particular, is how all these different people can come together for a central idea. So I'm gonna walk you through the techniques of making a glass bowl. Uh, we'll be talking about the many different ways glass can be used. Uh, this is a beautiful example uh, by Stephen Roth Powell, one of, the, um, uh, one of the pillars of the entire con uh, contemporary glass movement. Glass was <clears throat> traditionally in a factory setting. Uh, that um, uh, because of the expense um, and the scale that is needed and the skill that is needed, it was always generally done in a factory, uh, such as Blanco Glass Factory. It wasn't until Harvey Littleton back in the late 50s um, that kind of helped put glass into the hands of individual artists. And then the experimentation uh, began. The teamwork, uh, this is Mary L. Boss that I believe is represented in Florida Craft Art and uh, Jay Tout from Ohio uh, that was uh, very instrumental in building a lot of the equipment that we have in the hot shop. 
and you, uh, I was talking about the team effort, uh, and sometimes it even gets into almost circus Soleil type of work where scaffolding is involved. And this is Stephen Rock Powell and his team. Uh, I believe this is the video. This is Dan Alexander, a very talented artist that was at one time our emerging artist and we, he worked for us uh, for a stint. This furnace holds about 400 pounds of molten glass. And what Dan's doing is gathering the uh, small amount of the hot glass in clear to uh, create that first initial bubble. And it takes a while to set up a skin on the outside, but then we use wooden blocks that are kept in water. And that sets up a chill on the outside of the bubble that when we blow a bubble into it, it won't blow out the bottom. Most of the wood uh, items made uh, come from uh, cherry wood that are taken in the spring when the cells are the largest. And as you can see, Dan has trapped that bubble and the superheated air expands that but it takes talent to decide when to stop. To add more layers to the glass and to create a larger piece, um, artists gather the uh, glass under certain layers. Often the uh, colors will be incorporated into that, but for this demonstration, uh, the piece will be entirely in clear. So he's setting that up and building what is called a, a parasol. And some of the tools that he uses are the same tools that have been used for hundreds and almost thousands of years. Um, there's uh, simple metal tools. The new uh, tool that we're using, uh, you'll notice there, there's a wad of wet newspaper. And that's the New York Times. The reason we use New York Times is it does not mark the glass like other newspapers. And it's kept uh, very moist uh, so that he can shape during the process. And at this point, he's using a pair of jacks to create a neck in the piece that will eventually be where it's broken off the blowpipe and transferred to a solid uh, a rod called the punty. And here he's using that wet newspaper and people are amazed that we use that. But I got to tell you, that's the best way to feel the glass. Um, just like Tyler, when you're throwing on a wheel, you feel that when it's out of center, that's the same thing we're doing with a wet newspaper, is getting it on center. Lauren Hill is assisting him on this piece and she's uh, getting a very hot, fresh gather that will end up being a piece that will be a foot for this bowl. Dan will grab it, cut it off of her punty and form that into what will be similar to a hockey puck. That will allow him to give lift to that ball, as well as ensure that he doesn't break out the bottom of the piece when it's transferred. As you can see, he's using a, a flat steel paddle to get the piece flat, and then he'll be coming up around the piece to kind of form that puck shape. This must be a pretty cool day because normally they would be very sweaty at this point. Now she's taken the uh, punty and taken that glass and manipulated it in such a way that it will be a temporary bond that will hold the glass uh, to the solid rod as he taps it off the blowpipe because that's how a glass artist can actually work the opening of the piece. 
So he's creating this thermal shock that will separate right at that point. And it's a very delicate little tap that you give. Too hard a tap and the piece ends up on the floor. So she's heating the piece, uh, particularly at the back called flashing. That keeps that back piece warm enough, but not too hot that it sticks. And he's forming the opening of the piece using the jacks to use centrifugal force, as well as the jacks to gently open that piece. If he opens it too fast, it'll end up not being a bowl and it will probably collapse in on itself. So as you can see, it's pretty fluid at this point and it's moving around pretty fast. What he's dipping the jacks in are beeswax. That's actually, it helps uh, the glass not being marred. And he'll give the uh, piece a final DP and then start spinning it. This uh, artist used uh, centrifugal force and gravity quite a bit as one of their tools. And by spinning it out large and then folding it in on himself, on itself, it gives this uh, nice uh, ridges to the piece. In fact, some of uh, Dan's work is on display uh, at the uh, Bountiful Bowls uh, exhibit, and I invite you to come in and buy one of them. Now, after this piece is taken off the uh, blowpipe, it's put in an oven that slowly anneals the piece, which bring, means that it brings it down to uh, room temperature over a period of several days. Um, uh, in this case, it was probably about 24 hours, and it reduces the stresses in the piece. If we just left that bowl out, it would probably blow up and cause a great explosion. Uh, so by putting it into the oven, it slowly brings it down to room temperature, and that's where it can be actually cold work. The same bowl on the right is uh, the same technique, but incorporating colored uh, frits, which are minute particles of colored glass into the base glass to give it the actual color. And I'd like to talk about some other techniques that are beyond just doing bowls, uh, because glass is such a versatile medium that it can be used a lot of ways. Uh, canes are thin uh, threads of glass that are uh, picked up on punties and pulled into very thin threads. Uh, then those threads can be used by themselves, uh, incorporated into the blowing technique. Uh, they can be laid out, cut evenly, and laid out and create a larger cane, uh, such as you see on the left of the last slide. Now, this is Nancy Cowan, uh, a very talented glass artist that uh, Mary just curated a show that's in the Sandwich Museum. It's about Mary Childs, our art director. And Nancy is one of the featured artists there. She's a very prominent artist in the uh, United States, but known all over the world. She's taken some of these canes and is preheating them on a pastorelli, which is a plate that is brought up to about a thousand degrees. It's picked up and it's slowly rammed into the glory hole to bring it up to a molten um, temperature. Then she picks that up and incorporates that into the piece. And you can see from these different slides how they are uh, building up this particular piece that will end up being one of her wonderful clouds. Um, now, what makes this piece very unusual is that you see the spiral effect on the side. Well, very few artists in the world can do that. The technique was perfected by Lino Tiafla Petra, uh, who is considered by everyone in the world, including himself, as to be the best glass artist in the world. 
and he really is. Um, this is a reverse access uh, piece where he actually, or she actually closed off the original hole, sealed that up and opened up a new one on its side. So it's a very difficult technique that uh, she has mastered. Now, Marini takes that same cane idea and uh, takes it to another level, uh, taking those threads as well as manipulating uh, solid color around that. They form these bars that are long rods of maybe anywhere from one inch to four inch in diameter of uh, Marini. They're then sliced and put together on a pastorelli, very similar to the way canes are done, but it gives this very window, uh, window effect. One of the masters of Marini um, is David Patchen. Uh, we were lucky enough to have David in our studio uh, and in our gallery. Um, it took several times because every time that we uh, invited him to an exhibition, um, after many years of trying to have children, decided to have children at every single time that we had invited him to be here. This is the one time that he actually was able to show up. Uh, you can see where he's lined up these Marinis on the pastorelli and then formed it into a sheet and then picked it up on a collar of glass. And then he will close down the end of that after it sealed and blow a bubble in that and create his piece. Another way of using glass is uh, Elizabeth Sterling. And uh, although she does some glass blowing, her forte is more of the engraving. And uh, actually she only makes about 12 pieces a year. Um, she uh, works in a, uh, with one artist um, uh, in Seattle, creating these blanks. And then over the year, she will take uh, them, uh, do a design and magic marker, and then start uh, in her uh, studio, which is basically pitch dark. And she makes these foam holders with a light table underneath so that she has the light coming through. And then she uses diamond burrs at different grists to create the shading and the eyes. She's been a friend for many years and I've always been amazed by her work. Um, people are uh, in love with the way she does eyes. And for artists to be able to do eyes and be able to really capture um, she is a master at that. Sandblasting is something that I'm pretty familiar with. And like most artists, uh, we come to the techniques that we're known for um, mainly out of mistakes. And it's from those mistakes that we lead us to these new ideas and new ways of expressing ourselves. And when I first started blowing glass, I had a lot of imperfections. But having a graphics background, I learned how to carve out my mistakes. And that led me to being able to create scenes and imagery on pieces. And many artists use the process, uh, which is a cold working process. Um, in the sandblasting, we start out with a blank. It's taped up using um, a very uh, four mil uh, thick uh, vinyl tape that will act as a resist against the sandblasting, leaving just my images in the foreground. Uh, we start with that, draw it out with the magic marker. Uh, once we get the kind of idea that we want, then it's cut out with an X-Acto knife. The areas that we want sandblasted are peeled away, sometimes in layers to create texture. And then uh, we use a silicon carbide in a cabinet uh, that with pressurized sand uh, to be able to carve away the glass that, um, uh, that we wanna be able to leave just our image. Now, a step from just sandblasting the piece is taking it to another idea, 
which is called Grail or Grawl, if you're from the South. Grawl is a technique that you create a blank. Uh, if you can picture uh, about the size of an ostrich egg that's very thick, and it has layers of color both inside and outside. And after the piece uh, comes out of the oven the first time, it's taped up and sandblasted just like you saw in the previous uh, slides. But after it's completed, it's cleaned up and put back into the oven and slowly heated up over a 24 hour period, picked back up on a pipe using a collar of glass and then rush to the glory hole. If it doesn't blow up, you uh, let it chill down a bit and then you gather over that, creating more layers of clear glasses or colored glasses to uh, get enough glass to create a larger piece out of that. But the imagery is between the layers. It was perfected by an artist uh, in Sweden, Eva England, uh, back in the 1940, but it actually dates back to the Roman era uh, where they were doing a very similar technique. This is Alexis Silk and a master sculptor. She is the amazing artist that uh, lives in Italy in the Dolomites. She works out of the same study uh, studio that I worked out of in Italy and uh, amazing sculptor that sculpts not only the outside of the piece, but uses specialized tools to be able to sculpt the interior of the pieces too. That's how she's able to form the breasts and the buttocks uh, that you wouldn't be able to do from the outside of the piece. And the way she does these, they're almost like surgical instruments. And she goes, while the piece is molten, she goes inside with these tools and creates those forms. But keep in mind, that this piece is turning constantly. So it's, it's uh, very difficult to judge when to go in and how to shape that piece. And if you push too hard and you create too large uh, buttocks, uh, it, the piece is not what she envisioned. Uh, but there, we have many examples in the gallery uh, like Shelley Allen, um, Raven Sky River and Alexis and many others. Now, pact of air is a different technique that it, there's a couple of ways to do it. It's very <laughs> similar to bronze casting. A wax model is made. The waxes are carved just like uh, you would for bronze casting. A mold is made of that. The wax is steamed out of the mold and then that mold is inverted and put into an oven. A crucible is placed above. In most cases, it's just a flower pot with a hole in it, but he calculates how much glass to, uh, cold glass to put in there so that during the firing process, that glass goes down in through the crucible and fills the entire cavity. So just like a bronze caster, he has to build sprues, knowing which way the glass will flow and to create his work. Sometimes those glass pieces have to be in the oven for a month before he can find out if it was successful or not. Another way to do pat of air are using fresh particles of glass. I talked before about frit uh, being colored uh, particles. This is Deanna Clayton. Uh, she's given a number of master classes at our hot shop. She, uh, her master classes always seem to sell out. And there, there are four people that have never used glass before or worked in glass. So the same process, she takes a wax model that she's made, made a mold. In this case, there's two separate molds and there's the top and the bottom. She will start layering the frit on the layers of the walls of these and fire them. In this particular case with Deanna's work, when they come out of the oven, she uh, electroplates copper on the lips of them and then welds those together to create her final vessel. Uh, they, they look like they're exceedingly delicate, 
But uh, again, this is an artist I've known for about 35, 40 years. And I can tell you they are very strong. Now, flame working is another way of glass uh, making done primarily with rods, very hot acetylene torch. This is Jennifer Caldwell. There's a lot of teams in glass, often their husband and wives, because glass requires so many hours that it seems to be fitting that a lot of them happen to be married. She's married to uh, Jason Chattavarki, who does uh, cast cast work. In flame working, uh, we have some really wonderful examples uh, here in town. Zen Glass is a shop here in town that features that quite a bit. Uh, another artist that we um, show in the gallery is Kari Russell Poole. And she creates different vessels using these techniques. And you'll notice that there's quite a few different parts. Uh, so she'll make these parts over a period of days and they're kept in an oven that uh, keeps them warm, not too hot that they melt, but warm enough when she picks them up to create the final assemblage. She's be, uh, able to create these wonderful pieces. This shot is from uh, the Regent Explorer. Uh, it's a cruise ship that we, our gallery was lucky enough to have over 220 pieces of glass purchased for uh, the ship. And it's uh, a really beautiful ship. It's region Oceana uh, is all owned by uh, NCL. But I want to leave with uh, this one final thought is that to supporting artists is really important. You're not just supporting by buying that individual piece, uh, you're supporting a whole career, a whole idea of how an artist can pass along what they've learned and uh, sharing that. And glass is very much a sharing. So thank you for sharing your time with me tonight. I hope you come visit us at the gallery. But more importantly, I hope you stop by Florida Craft Art and see this wonderful exhibition. Uh, they're open uh, 10 to 5.30 every day. And on Sunday, they're there from noon to five. So welcome all. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to our Florida Craft Art series of talks on fine craft art. Our mission is to grow the statewide creative economy by engaging the community and advancing Florida's fine craft artists and their work. Our statewide nonprofit organization is headquartered in downtown St. Petersburg, which has a large gallery with more than 250 fine craft artists, all from Florida. We're open seven days a week. And on our second floor are 19 artist studios. Our adjacent exhibition gallery has eight curated shows a year accompanied by interesting educational programming. In order to bring these quality exhibitions and educational programming to our community free of charge, we depend on you, our supporters, and our sponsorships. I'm honored to be the main sponsor for Beautiful Bountiful Bowls exhibition. In addition, we have ongoing support from Perry and Lisa Ebert, the Florida Department of State, and the City of St. Petersburg. Thank you to continued sponsorships is exactly what keeps our lights on and paying our incredible staff. So. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts.